So, without if any further ado, James, if I can get you over here, I'll Thanks start your presentation. Thank you very much. Ah, good afternoon, everyone. Well, lovely introduction. Uh, I think Hans has pretty much uh, explained my worldview, uh, so I can go now. That's okay. Um, yes, Croft. I think that, um, I mean, I've been in the business, I came into the business in 1995, and, uh, and, and, and it was a very different time then. Um, we've had, uh, you know, years and years where it seemed the goal of, of IT was to, to get rid of people. That was the main initiative. How can we use IT to automate and remove people? Um, uh, remove all sorts of employees, ideally IT people, because you're just a cost center. Uh, we need to get rid of the humans and everything will be good. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really work out like that. And as a, as a company at Red Monk, we've been trying to focus on uh, the human aspects of technology and the social aspects uh, and why that tends to lead to better results. Um, we've got a thesis that developers are the new kingmakers. Um, that's not to say they're the kings, although some of them are. Um, but without having uh, developers on your side, it's unlikely that a platform is going to succeed. Without having developers on your side, it's unlikely as a business that you will succeed. Um, so that's me. Um, I'm Monk Chips. Um, yeah, I long ago lost my real name. Uh, now I just respond to this namespace. So I have about 20,000 followers there. And uh, I try and uh, I try not follow them all back, mostly because uh, a lot of them are in PR and marketing, and in my job, if I spend all my time listening to PR and marketing, uh, I won't be doing my job properly. Uh, so I try and track software developers and uh, to see what's going on. So that's Monk Chips, that's me. Uh, I was a, a journalist, um, but I'm kind of old enough that uh, I grew up with code. Um, I say old enough because now kids, technology is invisible to them. You know, it's all pinch and zoom. They don't have any idea how any of that kind of worked. I was lucky enough that I was there in 1984-85. Um, I had a BBC Micro, uh, and frankly, um, yeah, we didn't have a browser. Um, and you know, I was there typing in, typing in code and finding out that applications that you'd spent four or five or six or seven or eight or 20 hours typing in didn't work. And so you'd have to try and debug it. So I came from the environment where it wasn't where do you want to go today, but holy shit, how am I going to get this to work? So, um, Red Monk, who are we? Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Gartner and Forrester and those companies. And, you know, they provide a useful service. Um, they uh, are part of uh, corporate insurance. Uh, so when you have your Gartner contract, you cover your ass. So that's very good. Uh, in business, we like to reduce risk. Um, but I think that sometimes one of the things that we see in the analyst business, because it's based on purchasing, everything that they want to tell you about is based on purchasing. And that's great, but it does kind of mean that they're very, very good at uh, driving looking in the rearview mirror. Uh, because the stuff you bought isn't the stuff you're choosing. It's not how the world is going to change. Um, we're also a little bit skeptical about what some of the analyst firms do in that, uh, do any of you, I mean, do you like filling in surveys? Are you survey filling in people? Anyone here likes to fill in a survey? Phew, good, because I'm about to insult people that like to fill in surveys. <laughs> so it turns out that the people that fill in surveys are generally not the, the, the top people, because if you're really good at doing your job or anything else, you've got focus, you're working on that, you're not going to bother to fill in a survey. They offer you a chocolate bar to fill in a survey. They, you know, click on this link or something. Uh, we'll, we'll give you an MP3 or give you something that you don't really want. Um, so the problem with surveys is that you get responses that are um, uh, based on uh, people that may not be the best people to answer them. Uh, the other model, as I say, is, is to look at purchasing and try and understand the world through that lens. I think that's fine, uh, but certainly at Red Monk we had an issue, uh, which is that when we saw companies like IDC and, 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 and DataQuest, and by the way, I'm, I'm not standing up here to slag off my competition, I've just got an hour, so I thought I'd actually tell you who I am. Um, so yeah, if you, if you uh, go out and ask, uh, we had a problem because we wanted to understand Linux what was going on in the world of Linux. And if you went to the people that track market share via revenue numbers, something very interesting happened. There was only one Linux, and that was Red Hat. Uh, maybe a few shops were using SUSE, and they would say, great, okay, and how did they get that? 
Uh, they phoned up Dell, they phoned up HP, they phoned up IBM, and they said, hello, how many boxes did you ship this quarter, and how many of them were pre-installed with Linux? And from that, they were making prognostications about what was happening in the Linux market. At Redmond, we found that kind of weird, because we were kind of scratching our heads going, well, why isn't anybody mentioning Ubuntu? Well, Ubuntu was in the cloud. It was the platform that developers were choosing, um, and frankly, Red Hat wasn't getting a look in with this community. And if we look at a lot of the innovative technologies that have been delivered over the last few years, uh, very clearly Ubuntu was a huge part of that. But if you would ask the analyst firms at the time, you weren't going to get a, a good response. So Red Monk, we didn't like surveys, we didn't like numbers, so we just had lots and lots of opinions. Well, you can get away as being an opinion, qualitative kind of analysis for a while, but eventually you kind of think, well, actually, we do need to add some more rigor to this. One of the opportunities we've got is kind of a developer version of social media metrics and tracking. Because it turns out that developers are now living in these online environments, and they're leaving breadcrumbs that you can collect and gather and analyze. So if you're looking at Stack Exchange, if you're Stack Overflow, if you're uh, uh, looking at GitHub, you can look at, at, at check-ins, you can look at the tags for language, and you can begin to extract some information about that. I'm not saying that our data is perfect. Um, however, it's another useful data source, I would argue. So here's something that we just saw, for example, in the conversation about Spark, um, which we knew was, was taking on a lot of the, the, the conversation around Hadoop, but I think you really can't argue with that as a metric. That said, it is just a metric based on conversations, so we don't have all the data. So the new Kingmakers is a thesis, how developers conquered the world. As I say, I mean, I grew up in an environment where it seemed like developers is, how do we get rid of them? Can we outsource this function? If we create a 300-page requirements diagram, we won't need any human beings. We can just send this to uh, an outsourcing company, maybe in India, maybe in Brazil, somewhere else, and we'll get back these great results. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get back the great results. And what we've seen subsequently, I think, with the rise of Apple and the App Store, um, the rise of Amazon Web Services, we've seen a real change. We've seen customers going, wait, we want an App Store. Why can't we have this? Well, you can't have that if you won't invest in people. And it turns out that you have to treat developers better if you want them to stay with you. So we were talking this morning um, in, in the car on the way here, and it was kind of interesting. There was a view that perhaps they're a little bit further ahead in the States uh, in understanding that, frankly, you have to be having better types of IT if you want to recruit the, the best people. Um, now, uh, I was a little bit uh, suspicious of that because, frankly, there's a lot of crappy IT in the States. Um, but perhaps the view of, of human resources is, 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 is a little bit further ahead there just in terms of retention around this concept of the millennials. So millennials, do you, do you believe that millennials are different from the rest of us? I don't know about that, but they don't like bullet points. That's one thing I've noticed. Millennials in their presentations do not use bullet points. So you can tell my age because I have some slides with bullet points. But more pertinently, um, I, I think the simple fact is that an understanding of digital technology is not necessarily age-related, but we are seeing organizations that are understanding you need a better user experience. So um, software is eating the world. Uh, I don't know if any of you, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit of interactivity. Has anyone read the essay, Software is Eating the World? Anyone? Anyone? Go on, I bet you there's more there that haven't put up your hands. Okay, good, you have some homework. Uh, it's a great piece of work. Uh, Mark Andreessen uh, from Andreessen Horowitz, uh, you know, kicked all this off in 1995 with the Netscape browser and then more particularly the Netscape IPO. Um, which, which made it clear that you could invest a, a, a lot of money, you wouldn't necessarily win in a market, but it was possible to change the world. Um, so he's a, an investor of note now, and he wrote this essay just saying, look, we really haven't begun the internet disruption yet. It's very, very early days. I mean, we've spent, you know, since 95, and all we've really done is got better at shopping. Um, perhaps there are some other things that we might get better at. Um, so obviously, Amazon is very much more than a retailer today but they were just very, very good at optimizing the shopping process. I don't know if any of you saw their new Dash button. Have uh, you been tracking that? So Amazon now is going to give buttons to all of the brands so that when you run out of products, you can just press the button and get some more. Because Lord knows it's hard to shop in today's day and age. So you're going to have your Gillette button in the, in the shower, and you're going to have your... Uh, 
uh, I don't know, your uh, tied button in the laundry room or, or in the kitchen, wherever you, you do your laundry. Um, but I, I think more, more pertinently, um, Amazon is, is, it may have been uh, just a retailer, but clearly it's become something else. Amazon Web Services is a wonderful platform. You can get a lot done. And if we think about some of the disruptions we're now beginning to see, it's fundamental to industries. And I think, you know, let's have a look at what we're seeing in terms of financial performance. And these are the market capitalizations of some companies that we know, perhaps love, perhaps hate. But I think it's very interesting. I mean, you know, Kodak, I guess we know, um, is, is, is kind of out of the picture. It, it's amazing there is any market cap, in fact. Um, but, uh, you know, Instagram is coming in. I actually think that Facebook is the new Kodak. What we used to have, the Kodak moment, is now something that we share on Facebook. Um, I hate Facebook, but I have, my family is there, so I have to go there. It's the family platform. Um, unfortunately, there's a bunch of business people on there. I don't know. I don't want to delete them. I don't want to be rude. But I think, you know, Nokia, we know what happened to them. Apple came in. Um, Blackberry, again, it was kind of a hardware company. Uh, Sony versus Twitter. But the simple fact is, Barnes & Noble is a good example, I think. Amazon is a bookshop. Airbnb, the idea that hotel companies would be worrying about Airbnb or that transportation companies would be worrying about Uber, even four years or so ago, the threat posture just wasn't there. And I think what we're now seeing, you know, we, we, we had fairly aggressive conservative in, 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 in uh, industries. You know, the auto industry, as long as you're in the top five, that was fine. Nobody was going to come from outside and disrupt. Uh, now they're worrying that Google is going to be providing the software chassis. They're like, well, what is this Uber thing? And holy shit, these millennials, whether or not they're a thing, they don't want to buy cars. So what do we do if we can't sell cars? Um, you know, they're more interested in having a mobile phone with digital experiences than they are driving from A to B. The passport is no longer the car. There's no longer a, a driving license as a rite of passage. Um, software is eating the world. And uh, across different industries, um, you know, they've got a comfort zone. I mean, hotels are really filing that they're worried about Airbnb. Airbnb. Well, they are. So it's disruption, it's kittens, it's unicorns. I don't know if you've heard this word, unicorn. Uh, unicorn is a company that's valued at, at above a billion dollars. It's got a defensible strategy, apparently, which means that the VCs pour a bunch of money in there. They have a bunch of uh, private accounting that can keep the value high so that the retail investor gets screwed. Great model. Um, but the, the idea that there are these companies that are coming in, they're going to change an industry and they're worth betting on, there is a vast amount of VC capital supporting them, and they're coming in all industries. In London, where I'm based, financial services is obviously um, the, 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 the market that, well, as we know, London is, uh, I don't know, I guess, what do you say? Are we good at financial services because we lost so much money on them? I guess, that seems to be what the government thinks. Uh, of course, uh, the Dutch are quite good at, at financial services as well. Um, I understand that ABN AMRO just uh, made a $10 billion contract with IBM, so you can bet that banking is going to get much better from here on in. <laughs> and uh, that's the cloud platform for 2020, because of course banking will not change between now and then, and neither will the cloud. Um, so disruption, um, and, and unicorns, and, uh, and rainbows. Um, really interesting book by Jane McGonagall. Um, if we think, well, you know, let's get, take a step back and really think what an industry disruption might look like. Um, and, you know, uh, gamification is an interesting word. They've done some clinical trials uh, of social gaming, like Angry Birds. Um, and it turns out that, particularly for one constituency, young women, if you clinically trial how they feel after playing social games like Angry Birds, it has similar results to antidepressant drugs, and just as effective. And so I think from a pharma perspective, that has to be kind of scary. I mean, for me, it's good, because my wife likes to play Angry Birds. She's happy. So uh, we're in a situation where we begin to think, well, wait, if we're going to start putting games through clinical trials, really, what does that say to the existing industries? And pharma's got big challenges as it is. It's these huge bets they want to make all the time. Uh, they, want to, they want to control the science. Uh, they want a science that is not transparent, a science that, a science that only benefits them. Well, um, what if gaming comes along and changes that industry? Changes healthcare? What are the implications there? Um, healthcare is a great example. Um, look, I'm not going to say 
that Fitbit is the answer to all of our health problems. Uh, however, it's very clear that we as individuals do need to do a better job of managing our own health, whether it's our weight, whether it's our blood sugar. Um, you know, it turns out I'm allergic to wheat. It's a business model change for me, having seen me with beer in my hand. You can imagine, I'm always like, oh yeah, yeah, this is really good. Um, we need to be managing if we're a diabetic or, or these things. There are real opportunities, and we need to move towards wellness and a little bit less the sort of uh, healthcare that, that comes after the fact. And it's not just startups that are disruption, it's disruption word, disruption, disruption. Well, yesterday in London, the cabs all stopped on Oxford Street and said, we're not moving. We're just going to stay here. We're going to bring Oxford Street to a standstill. The pedestrians and uh, the tourists loved it. Um, it's, it's an interesting one because consumers and, and drivers really love Uber. As a sort of a lefty person like me, I'm like, yeah, but they're just taking the jobs and you guys, they're just going to go with driverless cars in three years and your turkeys and you're voting for Christmas. But, 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 but they're happy, you know? Um, they manage their own time, they get rated a five, it feels great, the consumers love the service. Um, so then it becomes, wait, it's the cabbies. And, and, and let me tell you, I mean, the black cab in London is quite a sort of a loved symbol. Um, you know, and we also love the fact that, you know, that we have to sit in the cab and, and have them uh, mumble on their racist nonsense. But, um, you know, it, 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 the simple fact is, is that it's an emblem, it's an icon of London. Uh, and, and, and people are now just choosing Uber instead. Um, the disruption sort of comes in this weird, it's, it's, you know, regulation, which all of these companies love to complain about, there's something really interesting happening in London at the moment. The Bitcoin people are all going to the regulators saying, please regulate us, please regulate us. People won't do business with us because we're not regulated. And that's pretty weird. This is quite a disruptive thing. As far as I know, everyone always wants less regulation. When do you ever hear a business person say, please regulate me? I mean, the truth is, you know, markets are regulation. Uh, without police, uh, without police for markets, there would be no markets. But there's a very, very strong uh, change going on here. Um, and from a technical perspective, we're seeing this massive fragmentation. And it's not just technical. I mean, I've talked about the businesses. Uh, banking is definitely up for significant disruption. Uh, they call it unbundling, uh, same as we had in telco. Um, so banks are going to begin to go, wait, the, you know, we've spent the past 20 years saying we do absolutely everything, and now we've got to unbundle this. Well, the technology is unbundling as well. So when I was, uh, you know, in, in the 90s, uh, you, you came into the business, it was very clear. We had Java and we had .NET. We had the database, it was a relational database, it was Oracle, that was what you were going to use, that was the corporate standard. That's all good, we don't need to think anymore, we just need to use that environment. Um, today, we've got MongoDB, um, whether or not you think it's uh, um, a stable platform, whether or not you think it's a convenient platform, the simple fact is a lot of people are using it. We've got Cassandra, uh, we've got Hadoop, lots of people uh, saying, wait, we don't need that world of ATL, ETL and Oracle, we're going to be using Hadoop, Put all, use that as our bucket of bits. Um, we, and you know, there are new databases uh, coming up all the time. Uh, Apple just bought this company called Foundation DB. They may be doing some replacement around Cassandra. We're going to be putting database in the cloud. Lots more choices, programming languages. Oh yeah, Java and .NET, that's it. Um, you know, uh, JavaScript, which is, is, had looked like a toy. Uh, and then something interesting happened. I mean, JavaScript, it used to be that learning it meant you weren't a serious software developer. Today, kind of the opposite looks true. No JS. Um, you know, for all the, the, the stuff they talk about, oh, it's non-blocking and awesome and scales forever, it's certainly worth looking at Node and, and the models that they're talking about. Java certainly looked at that. We had a framework called Vertex. Um, so there are all these frameworks, all these languages. Uh, you know, we've seen the rise of Scala. So there's lots of fragmentation. And fragmentation is kind of scary. We think, ooh, fragmentation, that's bad. How are we going to manage this? What are we going to do? We've got all these choices. How are we going to make these choices? What are we going to do? Well, I, you know, legal are the people that do all the IT purchasing. What are we going to do now? There's fragmentation. So um, one of the other things that's getting fragmented, thank God, is these big IT contracts. Because they're nothing more or less, in fact, than collateralized debt obligations. So CDOs, I don't know if you're familiar with that term. 
Um, it's what brought the banking industry down. Uh, you take a bunch of, of risk that you don't understand and bundle it up and say, hey, this is really good, you should buy this, and someone buys it. Um, and then it turns out that, in fact, there was a lot of fraud, a lot of people got mortgages they shouldn't have got, nobody had any visibility into this. Another very interesting that someone from the UK Home Office described a large outsourcing contract as effectively the same thing. You bundle up all the risk, you don't know what it is, you wrap it up, and then you say it's good, you call it an outsourcing contract, it's going to be $20 billion, it's going to be epic, and nothing's going to change. Don't worry, it's fine, the spec you've got is just right. So we're in a world where these big IT projects have to fragment, so here is fragment is a good thing. As you move something more agile, and we think, well, here are some things that we need to cut into chunks. What can we achieve rather than this massive vision of everything, of 300 pages? Um, I think the, the UK government is actually doing some really good work here. I don't know, am I asked uh, earlier, and, and uh, there's an organization in the UK called the Government Digital Service. Because what happened was, initially at least, they thought we can bring in some new steering about how IT should be done. Uh, we can learn about Agile, uh, we can learn about some of the tools and methods, some of the changes. And, and so we'll create this organization, and so they went in, they were supposed to be advisory, but of course everyone said, well, I want to take your advice. We're the corporate antibodies. We don't listen to you. So the, the GDS said, well, we'll actually have to start building things. So they started to actually build government services. And then the government was like, well, how do we hire people? So they said, oh, we need to break through these civil service pay grades, otherwise we can't hire them from the public sector. Um, so they broke through the pay grades. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and then uh, that's what happens when you break through the pay, gra pay grades. Um, and, and in fact, it's interesting, so now the UK Government Digital Service is competing with all of the London startups for talent, and competing and, and winning in, in many cases. Um, but, but it's the fact that right in the, 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 the cabinet office, the people running uh, government IT, and it, it's quite interesting because everything else should be outsourced. Get rid of the health service, that's a piece of shit. Privatize that, get rid of that. We could improve it if we privatize it. Um, anything public is bad, you know, we've sold off most of it, but if we could sell off some more, that would be good. In IT, at least, they've realized that they need some people there that know what they're doing. Bizarre concept. Because, you know, generally it's better to have a civil servant and a lawyer and a procurement professional do a 20 billion pound deal than to have somebody that actually knows what they're doing. That's right, isn't it? So Tarek Rashid, um, they, they've kind of realized this. So fragmenting big IT projects, that's like, oh, this is scary, this will take management. What, as opposed to abdicating yourself of responsibility by just giving someone a bunch of money. So explosion of forms. There are all sorts of, of different kinds of weird stuff out there. It's not all gonna survive. I mean, we're in a sort of a Cambrian explosion at the moment. Um, as I say, databases, languages, frameworks, ways of solving problems, uh, ways industries are constituted. Uh, we're able to, 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 to move at a faster rate, uh, come up with new forms, uh, smaller pieces. I think one of the interesting things here, at least, for the Redmond worldview, is we went through this thing talking about a Cambrian explosion of technology and what are the implications of that. And, um, and I kept worrying. I kept worrying because you think, well, okay, there's an explosion of stuff, but when isn't there going to be isn't there going to be an extinction event? When does the meteor hit? When does this stuff simplify again? And I worried about that a lot until I realised that actually, when you look at uh, the, the 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 growth of 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 different kinds of technology and and the opportunities that, that would create, and and compare that to the growth of phyla and groups um, in in biology. Um, there's plenty and plenty of room for growth. I mean, you get an extinction event, it's still going to grow afterwards. The rise of polyglot, um, nutcrackers. There are an awful lot of different ways to crack a nut. And, you know, you probably want to choose the one that works best for you. If anyone tells you this is the only nutcracker, well, um, they're just wrong. So we've seen people saying, well, okay, you know, we, we need to be able to have different languages. In the world of Java, and I know that many of you know this world quite well, um, this is good because it's on a JVM, so we've got these different language choices. You know, if we like Python, we can have Jython. You know, if we want uh, functional programming, we can look at uh, Scala. You know, there are many, many opportunities to run uh, JRuby. Um, interesting because you can get performance which is actually better in a virtualized environment than uh, the native one. Um, lots and lots of opportunities in terms of language choice, database choice. And looking at languages, 
I think one thing that is interesting in, you know, in terms of this notion of developers as, as kingmakers, but we, what we do is, is regularly do a scatter plot, uh, GitHub check-in in projects, um, and, and tags in Stack Overflow, what's the conversation? And we've been doing this for about four years now. Um, the thing that's interesting is for all the growth in JavaScript, Java is in very rude health. Um, developers continue to do interesting things with Java. Uh, I think, you know, case in point for the resurgence of Java, Java would be Hadoop. And you could argue, ah, oh, it is an accident, an accident of history that Hadoop was written in Java. And that's fine, but if you talk to the guy that made the decision, uh, Doug Cutting, um, he was very clear when he took the project on. So it was at Yahoo, and uh, his boss at the time was like, yeah, we want this you know, system so that we can pool our resources, so that we can do better data science, so that we can better serve ads, because the thing that the greatest minds of our generation needs to work on is getting people to click on ads. So um, they, they, they said, OK, and of course, you're going to build it in Ruby or some other cool language, right? And Doug said, no, I'm going to build it in Java. And they all said, no, you can't build it in Java. We're Yahoo. We're a web company. Um, Java sucks. You know, did you not get the memo? <laughs> Java is dead. And Doug said, well, yeah, yeah, about that. Well, Java is something I know. It's mature. It has all of the libraries I need. And it is a language that I can choose that when I build Hadoop, I can evolve it over time. There are governance models here in terms of Apache and so on that I can take advantage of. And in terms of evolvability of code, if you want a code base that we can trust, that we can evolve over time, I'm going to build it in Java. And if you don't like that, then you should find somebody else to build this. Doug Cutting was the new kingmaker, gave Java a huge shot in the arm. Hadoop has been huge. It's a reason to know Java. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, these web companies generally start by saying Java sucks. Um, and then later they grow up and turn into Java shops. So Twitter, major contributor to the JCP, the Java community process, um, supports Apache. Uh, they use a lot of Java. Now, they're still a little bit, you know, oh, yeah, but really it's JVM stuff. It's Scala. It's not really Java. It's JVM. That's not the same thing. Well, that's fine, except Hadoop actually is Java. Um, then you get, you know, Facebook. When Facebook came out, they're all like, oh, that, that Java stuff, that totally sucks. Um, and then they kind of went, well, actually, we need to use Hadoop. And then when they started to use Hadoop, um, from a performance standpoint and everything else, they had to invest heavily in Java. And then when they wanted a graph database to analyze some of the data in Hadoop, they choose Giraffe, which is written in Java, and it works with Hadoop. So there's sort of this, this is growth and innovation in Java, which is kind of interesting. And um, um, Tim Bray, lovely chap, one of the inventors of XML, lovely chap, um, wrote a piece about how Java sucked and uh, I should maybe give up on the Java sucks. I got at least three people asleep in the room, so we, we, we better get on some other environments. It, it may not be dead, but it'll send you to sleep. Um, so I think that the important thing, actually, looking at this, in terms of language choices, is we do have some clear uh, emergence of tiers. We've got kind of effectively three tiers here. Java and JavaScript continue to be important, PHP, Python, but there's a huge number of other languages. Um, I think the most interesting one on this chart right now in terms of the choices that languages are making is Swift from Apple. Uh, because you know, we don't see rapid change in this model, um, generally. Uh, Go, very well thought of. Go is going to be the language of DevOps and infrastructure, um, if you listen to some clever people. Um, it's it's kind of moved up a few points in, in the last uh, two, two and a half, three years uh, since, since it, it, it first appeared. Um, Swift has literally gone from nowhere into like 12. And that's partly the, the Apple imprimatur. And you could be, aha, you see, it's not that developers are kingmakers, it's just that app, yeah, developers love Apple. Um, there is something to that. But I think one of the things we forget, it was actually developers were the people that were choosing Macs before that became a mainstream phenomenon. The alpha geeks advantaged Apple. I mean, I remember when, you know, if I was lucky enough, 
uh, if I was traveling, that I got to turn left and go in business class. Unfortunately, um, yeah, I'm certainly not someone that, that usually gets that. But the first time uh, I did that and I saw someone with a laptop that was a Mac, you knew they were a software developer. Of course, now you go in and everyone just has an iPad. The, the revolution is in some sense over. But, um, you know, when we look at Apple, people say, oh, yeah, of course, people only develop for the App Store because that's where the money is. No, they didn't. They didn't learn Objective-C for the money. They learned Objective-C because they loved the Apple device so much, they wanted to build something cool and they wanted the props. The developers were the kingmakers. They didn't do it for the market. They did it for props. They did it for their egos. They did it to be part of a community. So developer to developer, this is a new thing now. Developers are making these choices and we can actually make money out of it. Um, you know, uh, Atlassian is, is, is a company that I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, and, you know, they're going to be a company that, that IPOs based on selling to developers. I think these numbers from Twilio are really interesting. I mean, these are just API calls. Um, you know, annual, annual uh, revenues of $100 million, that's pretty good. I mean, you know, the, it, it, it takes a lot of companies a long time to get there with packaged software. They're moving very quickly. And this notion of a million dollars in extra recurring revenue every seven days, I'd love that. that that's a good model to have. And they don't have to bother with sales. They don't have to bother with legal. They don't have to bother with procurement. They just have to make developers really love their stuff. And I think this is interesting. And there are some other companies. I mean, New Relic is another example. That's going to be IPOing this year. That there are now businesses that say, hey, look, I'm not going to bother with all the crap. I'm just going to sell directly to these, these developers and let them make the choices. I'm going to treat them right. Uh, microservices. So this is... Uh, the latest buzzword in this industry, I mean, from Twilio, you know, just an API call, they're supported in, in this. This is uh, IBM's pass here. This is Bluemix. It's based on Cloud Foundry, which is also sold by Pivotal. So you've got choices. Um, and basically, the idea of microservices is that we're going to uh, use these small, single-purpose services in order to compose and create larger applications and services. And you're like going, wait. Uh, we already did that. It's called SOA. It's the same thing. Um, and there's some truth to that. I mean, one of the things we see in IT, generally we implement, re-implement, rinse, repeat. Um, we do this stuff again and again, and that's kind of fine. Um, you know, developers get bored, so they have to build the same thing again. You know, test of any new programming languages, have you built a CMS in it yet? So microservices is this notion of, of, of putting things together in, 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 in a way that uh, is, is, is more, more tightly encapsulated. It's probably going to have uh, a RESTful interface of some kind, and we're going to build services accordingly. So this is package up all the services to make life easier for developers. For Twilio, awesome. Those numbers look great. Of course, for IBM, the kinds of numbers that Twilio reports don't even register on the... Well, they don't even register on the register. I mean... You know, for IBM, they need to be making squillions of dollars for it to be a thing. So IBM's going to have to get real good at making developers like their stuff really fast, or this could be a problem. And I'm sure you all have opinions on that. Um, the key reason I think this is different from SOA, and in terms of this fragmentation narrative and everything else I'm talking about, is that it, it's, it's about throwing stuff away. So the SOA wave, the 4GL wave, the component-based development wave, everything we've done in computer science and IT for the past 20, 30, 40 years, or you know, since IBM was a weighing machine company probably, um, uh, has been based on, on object reuse. It's going to be a reusable service in the enterprise. That's going to be really good. We'll write it once, and then everybody can rely on that. We'll have a single canonical da data model, and everything is going to be awesome. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, as long as we can, if we can use that, we can get rid of some developers. It'll be great. We'll have one service, get rid of all the developers. So that's, that's what we want. Object reuse or service reuse. Well, one of the things we're seeing with microservices and the web company approaches and the different approach was well described. Um, uh, well, I, I ascribe this to a guy called Adrian Cockcroft. Uh, was at Netflix, is now an entrepreneur in residence and will do something else cool soon enough. But he said, no, no, we've been doing it wrong. 
And, and it's about how we treat our applications and services and infrastructure. We treat them as pets when we should treat them as cattle. So, you know, we, we give our servers names. You know, we go and give it a cuddle every now and then. Please don't fall over. Nice server. This notion of, of kind of treating things as pets. Yeah, we give them names, lots of care and feeding. We better go in, let's go feed the server. Come on, let's, let's go feed the service. You've got to feed the server, you've got to water the server, you've got to worry about the server. But, but we, you know, with Google, we began to hear this thing is, what do you mean you throw away servers? You throw away your pets. You're going to throw away your pets just because they got a little bit old and worn down. You're going to take it to the doctor and give it a shot, say goodbye. You know, no, they said, we don't give a shit. We build an architecture where if a server goes down, it doesn't have an effect, and we just throw that shit away. Now, of course, I mean, cattle, I guess you don't throw it away. You just eat it, right? So that, that's a good thing. And I, I, one of the things in, in, in this slide was I had to find, I wanted, I wanted to find cattle that didn't look like friendly, nice cattle that you might give a name. So I thought this one was good. Like, we wouldn't mind losing one of those. And we need to think about low K servers. We need to let them go, right? We, 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 we can't be giving them more care and attention. If we lose a node, the network needs to keep on performing. It needs to keep on. And I actually had a really limited understanding of this. I hadn't had this sort of light bulb moment. Because to me, it was still actually, oh, you're just talking about the scale out architectures that we've been building for these past few years since the web. You know, you kind of root something, you hit one server, you shard. You know, this is all going to be fine. It's well understood. Um, well, it turns out it actually goes further than that. And it's really not just about uh, you know, database architecture. Uh, it's not just about uh, what, what Google had bought. But it's about disposability. And, and you might be throwing away the application logic. You might be throwing away the data. And you don't rely on something and expect that it's going to be there in 20 years' time. I mean, increasingly, and part of this move in fragmentation is an acceptance that actually stuff needs to be disposable. We're going to throw some of it away. And of course, you know, in fact, earlier this week, I was uh, on a call with Oracle, and I said, people are going to throw data away? That's a terrible idea. Data's the best thing ever. And I'm like, yeah, well, you're Oracle. You would say that. Like, keep all the data. And I said, well, if you did that, then that would be the entire world's GDP. I mean, YouTube, if it ran on, on Oracle, um, well, there would be no world, because all of the money would be in Oracle's pockets, and the, I don't know what would happen, but it would be bad. <laughs> so we're in an environment where we need to start thinking of, of, of not about the pets. Oh, God, they look nice, though. I want to feed those pets. I want to go, um, but on the other hand, hey, it'd be quite nice to be out with the cattle and, and thinking that, in fact, everything needs to be disposable. But of course, how do you dispose of a $20 billion outsourcing contract? You know, how do you dispose of your single canonical master data management model for the enterprise? Um, perhaps we've been doing it wrong. And perhaps we should be moving towards more disposable kinds of architectures. And that's the key to this microservice thing is that what they're saying is, actually, we're not building the microservice for reuse, we're building it for disposability. And we need to be able to throw away all of the bits and pieces because the business service is going to change and so on. And, and you know, actually, I've got a lot of sympathy for the Oracle position, um, just from the perspective that, um, well, as I like to sort of, I say that, that, that uh, applications are like fish and data is like wine. Only one improves with age. So, um, software in the 20th century, I see what I did there. We had cattle, now we have farming. Um, we lived in an environment uh, that was very well understood that we could put a fence around it, sustainable competitive advantage fence. And, uh, you know, we had our mainframe, and that was good. Um, you know, that was, that was a very proprietary environment, and that was good. Proprietary is good because you can farm that, and, you know, other people won't come onto your farm. You can control the environment. Or Java, we'll put a fence around it, put a fence around our developers, keep them in, don't let them go to events, they might learn something. <laughs> so you, you put a box around the developers, okay, okay, this is good. It, put a fence, in fact, not just a box, let's have some barbed wire. Um, barbed wire around the entire, uh, sort of around the, 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 the Oracle database. Um, lots of barbed, get, let the DBA manage all the data. Give him a whip or something, not just, not, it's not enough to have not enough to have barbed wire um, around the database. 
so it takes kind of you know 12 months to make a change. But uh, you know, just given lots and lots of tools to tell the developer no. So yes, a world of fences um, and sustainable competitive advantage and 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 proprietary. Um, it's kind of fine. Some companies did really well in that environment, uh, made a bunch of money. Um, you know, some customers actually even got some good results in, in this environment, being a little bit flippant. But as a farmer, you don't really need to particularly learn something new. You know, you put your head down, you dig, you know. Um, I'm not a farmer, to be fair, so maybe, I don't, maybe you do have your head up a bit more. But you dig and you plant your seeds. You know when to water it. You know what time the sun will come up. You know everything that's going to happen. So you don't need to worry about change. Um, well, unfortunately, just sort of stop worrying like that because this fragmentation thing. And ah, let's put our heads up. Let's start foraging. Let's eat at Noma for a change. You know, let's 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 think about. Well, hang on a minute. Um, actually, we don't have to buy everything. It's not just a farming environment. We're going to look look at what's out there. There's all this open source stuff. And not only is there open source stuff, but I can go to Amazon. I can spin up an instance. I can play with the open source stuff very easily. Um, so this is great. I can forage for bits and pieces and put them together, and I can create some beautiful-looking meal, or ideally a, a useful business service. So moving, uh, what, what we've seen is that developers today, and I don't know if there's been any millennial shift, but developers today start by looking for things and foraging for things rather than going to the farm. Um, and, and you know, I could take it a little bit further. I do like my metaphors. I tend to take them too far. Um, when I did the, and, and you know, um, foragers have more sex, so that's a good thing. Um, farmers, on the other hand, have more beer, so that's probably a good reason to, to farm. Um, so the, you know, it's just this this, and it almost again being meta. I mean, we get this view that everyone that's a software developer is, is uh, and none of you have this view, and I can see you're all actually a very healthy bunch, so this is good, but with this view that, oh, software developers are in the dark, they're, they're eating pizza all the time, they're fat, they don't have very good social skills, they don't get out much. I don't know, I mean, it seems like that was all just kind of a way to keep uh, a community of people down. And I think that, that that sort of changed, because with this fragmentation and everything else, with this need for great software experiences, great software designers and so on, you actually have to treat them better. You, you have to let them get out. You have to let them forage, because otherwise, they'll go and work for somewhere else. Um, you know, you spend all of your time saying, we're going to get rid of you, we're going to outsource you. Funnily enough, eventually people are going to go, I've had enough of this abusive relationship. I'm going to go and get a different job. Now, some of you are currently working in abusive relationships. You have not yet got the memo and um, you're, you complain about your job. Um, I don't think there's anyone in this room that has an excuse to complain about their job, because you're talented people, and if you don't like your job, get another one. Um, be a forager. Put your head up, get some exercise, uh, and, uh, and, you know, what is it? Prefer unhappy folk to be free to leave. It's almost like I had it planned. So, free-range developers. We can be agile. Um, we're going to be healthy. Uh, we're going to be out there, and we're not going to be like you know, farm battery environment, sort of uncomfortable, burned limbs kind of chickens. We're going to be free-range chickens. Um, we talked about that this morning. Think about that, this, the, 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 you know, why would you not want to be in a healthier environment? And IT has not been healthy. Let's make it healthier. Let's make it free-range. Let's have choices. Um, we're, not, we're not battery hens. Even Microsoft, the king of the farmers, now has to forage. They used to have this thing, everybody can come to our farm. Every couple of years, we'll do a big conference, professional developer conference, everyone will come to our farm, and it's going to be great, because they're going to get the bits. They're going to get Longhorn. Oh, wait, that's cattle. Um, so I think it's very interesting that Microsoft now has realized, actually, they're kind of, well, that model is broken. They need to go to where the developers are, because the developers are foraging. And when you've got a general manager um, in terms of platform strategy saying you have to go where they are, then we kind of know the game is up. Things have changed. So if developers are not at Microsoft, where are the developers? Aha. GitHub. So GitHub is just an extraordinary phenomenon. 
Um, who here has a GitHub account? That's awesome. I'm going to call that 100%. <laughs> I told you I wasn't very good at the old quant stuff. So um, yeah, it, 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 that actually was impressive. Because even two years ago, that wouldn't have been the, oh, well, actually, maybe, maybe for the Luminous community, it probably would have been like that. But most companies, it's not the case. Uh, let's just say when I did that at a Software AG event, I think only one person put their hand up. But um, yeah, GitHub, it's absolutely incredible, the impact it's made. Um, that is where the developers are. And um, the speed as well, you know, not just of, of the independent developers saying, actually, this is where I want to be, because you can learn so much. It's so great because you start with a search. And it may be that somebody hasn't actually finished what they were doing, but they put a gist up. They started working on something um, that, that you saw some relevance in. And you can say, well, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to learn from that. I'm going to do that myself. And this is a very different world because it used to be you could get fired if you immediately went because you had a problem to solve and did a search. Jesus Christ, if you search for something, you might do a patent infringement. Don't do that. Do everything from scratch. Total not invented here. We work at IBM, damn it. We don't do searches. Or, I mean, I've used them a few times. I guess they're a big context. Big client of mine, by the way. Um, I thought they may be seeing this video. I don't know. That should be OK. Um, so GitHub, it, it, you start by saying, I want to find some code to do a particular thing. But it goes further than that. I want to find the people. I can follow the five best software developers on the planet right now find out what they write, when they write it, and hopefully I can add something to that. And that's kind of amazing. We couldn't do that before. You couldn't be effectively in the room with the best software developers in the planet looking over their shoulder, kind of pair programming with these incredibly uh, gifted people. And I, I think that's the thing about GitHub, is it's a real social revolution um, as much as it is uh, something really extraordinary, which is turning Git, which is not for humans, into GitHub, which is something for humans. Um, and, and so what's that about? Um, and in fact, I might have to... Is this going to take me back? Oh, God. So anyway, um, is, is this a Dutch thing that you go that way to go forward? It's a bit like Americans being confused by British lights. To turn the power on, you go down. How does it work? Yeah. They, oh, it's got to go the other way. So this is interesting, going backwards to go forwards. Um, anyway, so GitHub. Forking is the thing that I wanted to talk about, but the last slide was TDD. One of the changes we've made is, is thinking, hey, look, uh, you know, we've, this waterfall thing, 300 page requirement stock, that's great. Well, then we can have a gazillion lines of code, get some developers to write that. And then after that, we're going to send it off to, to QA. We'll send it to a different group for load testing. They'll all use different infrastructures to do this stuff, and it's all going to be great. It's all going to be great. Um, except that it wasn't. You'd find that you built something, the developer built something, and then when you wanted to put it in production, it would break. What we've seen today is developers said no. There's been a big land grab, by the way. Developers said no, this is horseshit. It's you guys. You've all taken, taken stuff back. Said DBA, I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to do no SQL. I refuse to listen to your DBA schema nonsense. I am going to go and do no SQL. So we built no SQL databases. Waterfall is horrific. Nobody likes Waterfall, certainly from a developer perspective. Consultants love Waterfall. Developers don't like Waterfall. OK, we're going to do Agile. One of the things with Agile was testing. I think what's interesting is when you listen to the consultants that are still trying to sell Waterfall, and they're like, oh, the, the thing with Agile is there's no testing, so you can't trust it, which is, of course, the opposite. That's, that's called projection. They're looking into the mirror. They don't actually do any testing. So they, they think that, that Agile doesn't. So, Agile is all about testing, test-driven development. And that, that, that last slide, if I was technical enough to get to it, um, <laughs> was about riveting. And, and that riveting is an interesting thing, because what they found in making ships is that the interesting thing happens. If you say, hey, Marcel, it's your job to do the riveting. And then you say to the chap next to him, it's going to be your job to come down the next day and go and check all of that, those, those rivets. What's Marcel going to do? Oh, this is great. Oh, do I, they're, they're fine. I'll let QA deal with that. So that's all good. But when they built ships, they realized that actually it's a really good idea to have the person that does the riveting do the QA. 
they've got to do the testing as they go along. It might make them slower, but you're going to get much better results. Less remediation, smaller teams, more effective. And so agile, and particularly test-driven development, we now you know, have, have nice phrases like continuous integration. That became, became, hey, it's a fragmented environment of microservices, so we need to test a lot of, we need to do a lot more testing in development. Um, unit testing. Um, and, and, and certainly, Agilists, the other one, oh, the, thing, the problem with Agile is there's no data there. The opposite, of, again, is true. Agile is all about data. Developers are lazy. They want to make things better, so they want data that will help them make things better. And, and that's really what we're talking about in Agile. One of the things I think that's very hard for all of us is investing in design. Um, I do not have the design gene, um, uh, although I can make quite good birthday cards out of cup card. That's, that's something I'm, that's, that's my art. Um, but I can't draw, I, you know. These days I'm a bit more design curious. So uh, occasionally I will notice a font. In fact, not a font, see designers would call them typefaces. I'll notice a typeface. I'm, I'm actually happy with this. This is just Microsoft, this is Calibri, it's fine. Um, but I, th I think the key thing here is involving developers early. Because it's not enough to have agile where you've got the business and the developer working closely together. You've really got to have design earlier in the process. Because if one thing we've seen from these people choosing stuff that we call millennials from Apple, from all of this, is design can't come after the fact any more than QA or testing can. You know, it's the Robert, if any of you have read a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, it's about quality. Quality cannot be like tinsel that we drop on a tree after the fact. It needs to be the roots and branches from which everything grows. So you've got to make it part of the process. In design, you can't add after the fact. So new set of disciplines. It's not enough to be a developer. You've got to be working with, with designers too. Um, you forge all the stuff afterwards. You don't prematurely optimize, because if so, you're going to end up with, again, bad results. You can spend, you know, to get five nines, you're going to spend five nines. You know, there's no way around it. It's, it's, it's the, the more you invest in scale, uh, the, ha the harder it is to get the project done. I mean, if Twitter had a begun and said, right, we need to have the workload that it now has, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have even started. You know, they started small, they forge it over time, and occasionally you have to dispose of it, throw it away, and start again, because it's not effective enough. You know, Twitter is interesting because they made the user celebrate downtime. I loved it. Oh, I can concentrate. Twitter's down. Whew. Zen moment. It was great. Um, now, there's no downtime. JVM languages, it's all working great. What a nightmare. I'm on Twitter all the time. I don't get any downtime. Um, so you want to forge something after the fact. You, you're, you're adding and hardening things after, not before. And all this stuff is about craft, investing in people, understanding that what they do is a craft. Yes, yes, it's a discipline. Yes, it needs to be part of something that looks industrial. But just because it's an industrial process doesn't mean that they're cogs, doesn't mean that they... And this is interesting. The infrastructures need to be disposable, but the people Kind of not. You want to invest in people. You want them to stay with you. You want them to understand the business. And you need to celebrate their craft. And you need to let them exhibit that craft. And you need to let them pass on those skills. I mean, I think this notion of, of, of kind of, um, uh, and, and, and I'm not saying this, this but, but multi-generational carving. So a guy that starts a carving, um, you know, so I said people might be disposable, starts carving in the knowledge it will be completed by later generations. Or in the past, we had churches like that. We need to be able to pass on these skills. And people tend to like passing on the skills. I'm not saying all developers do, but let them do that. Let them go to events. Give them some freedom. Let them go on GitHub. Um, because this is a key thing. It's, it's, it's a craft. We can't put it in some knowledge management system and hope that everything will be OK when they leave. So in praise of forking, I spoke about fragmentation. And I, we, you know, sort of, it used to be the forking was the worst thing ever. I, when I came to the business in 95, it was like, forking is terrible. We're really worried that we're going to see, you know, that, that, that Unix is forking. And I was like, yeah, OK. Yes, there were different Unix versions. And yes, you kind of got a little bit locked in. But that was still a massive step forward from the days of, of you know, Honeywell and, and digital and it all being a much more complicated thing. We move to more common, commonality. Um, so forking, like, yes, it, it is bad. You don't, you don't want to support multiple code bases necessarily, but forking in the GitHub sense or in the Git sense, 
where I'm making a pull request and I'm saying, I want to work on this code, can I do that? That's awesome. And as we've recently seen in the traditional sense, in the Node.js ecosystem, there was a bunch of, well, Joint got a bit greedy, um, and the community has forked. But what's interesting, they've created a foundation. It looks like it might come back together again. The fear of forking that we had um, isn't completely justified. Um, and I think it's very interesting. You know, Cloud Foundry, when they set out, said, actually, for us, we're going to use forks as a measure of traction, because download numbers don't really tell us anything. What we want to know is who is engaging with our code, who is making a pull request, and who is forking. Um, Git, yes, it's a great way to, it's, it's a great infrastructure for this. It has won. Uh, Git has basically smashed everything else. Um, distributed version control has smashed everything else. One canonical model does not work. Uh, you need a distributed model in order to have effective uh, developers that can get on with stuff. Um, resolving the differences is, of course, the key. You've got to be able to resolve the fork, whether through governance or through code. This stuff is hard. GitHub has helped to make this a bit easier. It used to be that developers had to ask for permission because everything was expensive. Um, developer tools, people used to have to pay for them. Um, now developers won't pay for anything except Apple products <laughs> and, uh, and, and Twilio. Um, but, but, but yeah, you know, uh, it, it, it certainly it, the idea that you could just download a database and get on with it because the business asked you to, that's new. And this is hugely empowering for businesses and developers. You know, it's just to do with the fact that all the stuff is cheaper. You know, we know all about this. Moore's Law, it's great. Everything gets cheaper. Amazon packages it up in an awesome way. Um, I like this chart because uh, this is what happened in Silicon Valley. Um, 2006, why did the total number of deals go up and the average deal size go down so dramatically? 2006, come on, I've only got three minutes left. Answer the question. One of you's got the answer. Something that happened in 2006 that meant we had more startups than before. Which? iPhone apps? No, nah, not quite in terms of timing. I've mentioned it a few times today. Yes, you all guessed it. It's Amazon Web Services. <laughs> so Amazon Web Services came in, but of course, it's not really Amazon Web Services is the key. It's a company called Y Combinator, because what they did is they industrialized the model. Because it's not enough to just have cheaper infrastructure. You need a way of doing this. You need an approach to generating lots and lots of companies. And look, a lot of those companies are bullshit companies. We know that. And there's a lot of ridiculous apps out there, stuff that, I mean, there is a company in Silicon Valley right now called Caviar. Guess what they do? Deliver caviar. On-demand de on economy, what horseshit. But, you know, there actually are some, some companies that, that, that do good work. And I think we need to think from an enterprise perspective, yeah, not all of the companies will be great, but they're getting a lot done. There are a lot of options for us. Some are disposable, but some of them are going to create great value. What can we learn from that model? Um, borrow from the web companies. Code. Oh my god, Netflix. Chaos Monkey is awesome. Netflix does some interesting stuff. They know that systems are going to break. Chaos Monkey is designed as part of your environment. Say, look, actually, we know so much is going to break, we're going to make it break for you. Netflix, not only do they use Chaos Monkey and say, hey, we're going to make it break for you, but they also do a thing where developers are responsible for fixing things. So they're like, by the way, if it breaks at 2 a.m., you're getting up and fixing it. And by the way, we may have broken it with Chaos Monkey. So how do you like them apples? Um, but they overpay them in the market. Netflix says, we always pay more than market rate because we want great people. So they're contributing code, all that good stuff. Oh, the beer stopped it working again. I've only got one minute. Um, what am I talking about? Does any of this make sense? Does craft make sense in this environment? Surely it's the, the volume consistency market that wins. Well, look at beer. Beer is a great example. Many of you drink Heineken. Some of you may even like it. <laughs> um, but, but the simple fact is, is, if you optimize for consistency, sometimes you don't get the great and wonderful experiences. And what we're seeing in markets around the world, craft beer exploding, volume beer shrinking. And it's not all because I'm slightly wheat intolerant. <laughs> so this is a very interesting thing. And what does that say about software? Software is craft. Coffee. You know, people spend a lot of money for these better experiences, these better developers. Here are the beers in London, and there are loads more every day. And you can meet these people. It is awesome. Look, they're a community. Sorry? 
Oh, there you go. Yeah, make beer, not war. Um, London Fields Brewery. Uh, interesting, oh, don't get me started on that. Interesting story. Uh, uh, the, uh, based on uh, uh, cocaine smuggling money, that, 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 that company. Uh, actually true, the guy was busted, didn't go to prison, started a brewery. Make beer, not war. He then got arrested for tax evasion, which is hilarious. <laughs> uh, Jules, lovely chap. Um, so these guys, and, and this to me is like IT. The community is exposed. We know who's building the code. We know who's building the software. We're being more social. This is great. Fragment, dispose, all this stuff is great. If it's not quite so good because it went off, fine, we'll throw that beer away. We'll make another batch. It will be really good. It's going to be awesome. So everything is great in the garden of, well, it wouldn't be a garden because kind of farmers do garden, in the forest of paradise that I'm describing, except look at all those dudes. They're all white. Where is the diversity? So there's a lot that's good that's are happening. Lots disposable, but bro culture is an and I can't blame them, actually. It's my fault. I told you, when I came in... <laughs> come on, you can't argue with the correlation like that. So when I came into IT, all the women left. <laughs> this is really fucked up. We've got to fix this. We've got to fix this. Why are we not welcome? You know, why are we not welcoming communities? Why are women... I mean, women invented a lot. In fact, the word computer used to mean the woman that does computing. And yet now they're leaving IT. That's fucked up. We need to fix that. Um, diversity in general. Um, yeah, it's really scary, and it's getting worse. I mean, this Gamergate thing, truly terrifying. And some of you are thinking, oh, God, not this again. I've heard all this before. <sighs> well, A, I bet you don't have a daughter, because if you did, you wouldn't think that. And B, you've clearly never been to YouTube. Because second comment, it starts. Never mind Godwins and Nazis and all that crap. I'm telling you, the vile stuff you see, totally unacceptable. So Tim O'Reilly described architectures of participation. We all need to get better at this. Because all of this wonderful world I'm describing, it needs uh, more women. So you need to be more welcoming. Um, it's true. True story. So, feminist hacker Barbie. Uh, yeah, because they actually made a book, Barbie, Barbie the Hacker, and, 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 and it, said, um, it said, oh, uh, yeah, I've just made some mock-ups, but I'm going to have to get Brian to come and actually code it for me, because I'm just a girl. So, you know, Brianna Williams said, well, that's horseshit, um, and, and so feminist hacker Barbie was born, and I like that, because men today do discuss male grooming tips. And yes, uh, there are plenty of women out there that are really awesome at coding and, and could show us a thing or two. So let's, let's understand that actually we have a problem. Um, for all of the awesomeness, we have a problem. The disruptors I've talked about, they're awesome at disruption and they're also awesome at not paying tax. That is a core competence. If you don't pay any tax, you're, you're really good at business. You can start putting other people out of business. You also don't create many jobs, but hey, you know, who needs schools? Who needs jobs? Who needs all this stuff? We do. So disruption's fine, um, but I think we need to be a bit more like web companies, focus on diversity, pay our taxes, and um, hopefully we'll get some good results, because it is the end of business as usual. <laughs> Thanks.